The best known and the most played cube is the MTGO Vintage Cube. Today we tear the cube apart. Let's learn how to smash the opposition and to better our own cube design. I partner in this effort with Team Jbro, the cube connoisseur and expert streamer who recently won the SCG Con Winter 2019 $10,000 Cube Draft Championship. Furthermore, he is the all-time leader in cube trophies, having been trophy leader for 10 of the last 14 MTGO cube seasons. Welcome to Cultic Cube, where we cube religiously. We make you better at cube and make your cube better. The Moto Vintage Cube is a saccharine confection and a rare treat that for a time only came around during the winter holiday season. I have spent many an hour over the holidays holed up at my in-laws' house, rooting for my favorite magic personalities as they cracked black lotuses and channeled Eldrazi. The cube has been designed to be splashy and larger than life, full of iconic cards and big moments. It is the Ringling Brothers Circus of Cube. A powered cube such as this can feel overwhelming, like the sort of environment that only the most adept players could ever hope to navigate. Today we will really dig into the cube and its design to learn how you or I can be the heroes of our own cube story, both as cube curators and players. In this video we will diagnose the splashiness and consider its impact on the viability of particular strategies. We will remark on the design of the cube generally, as well as in the composition of each color, singling out individual cards that overperform or are traps. Finally, we survey the most effective deck strategies, taking one in particular as a test case. I am delighted and honored to be joined by expert cube connoisseur Team J Bro, who will explain how he uses such analysis to pick up percentage points in draft and in play. I am super excited for a peek into his thought process as he constructs 3-0 decks, and I look forward to learning which cards merit his special attention. Magic is the best game ever made, and cubing is the best magic ever made. I am Team Jbro, and I am a Magic the Gathering streamer and cube connoisseur, and I could not be more happy to join Cultic Cube on this video. This is an awesome opportunity for collaboration, and we hope that you, the viewer, get a kick out of it, find it insightful, and hopefully entertaining. Now we're talking about the Vintage Cube, which represents a really extreme side of the cube spectrum and pushes the limits of limited power magic. Now whenever I survey my viewers, my jabronis, it is without exception the most popular cube. People love it, and why not? You can do all sorts of awesome things in a way that's small d democratized for everyone. It lets newbies and OGs alike engage in outlandish, mox-fueled power plays, and that's pretty dang cool. Cultic Cube is supported by you. Please drop by my Patreon page, where you will find the many exciting perks that patrons receive. I'm a TCG affiliate as well, and if you make a purchase there after following the link in the video description, I will receive a small commission at no cost to you. My sincere thanks for your support. This cube is designed to let people experience some of the flashiest, most iconic cards in the history of the game. Apart from those relatively few people who play Vintage or Legacy, most of us do not have an opportunity to resolve many of these spells, and those eternal constructed environments are typically so lean and so tuned that they preclude the experimentation that Cube encourages. This particular Vintage Cube is meant to allow you to do broken things, and it succeeds admirably in this goal. It is, however, not designed for longevity or playability over a number of drafts. The version of the cube to which we refer is the Summer 2019 MTGO Vintage Cube. Wizards will doubtless revise the cube in the future, but if the past may be our guide, the broad strokes of this discussion will likely remain salient. A quick introduction to this cube is that it has 540 cards, among which are the Power 9, plus their usual addenda, such as Soul Ring and Library of Alexandria. A quick cube design tip. If you are running power, I encourage you to maintain a 360 card cube so that all of the power is opened at a traditional draft table. In this environment, many flavors of combo were quite well supported. The cube encourages drafters to adopt cheaty strategies, but control and aggro are available as well. Still, I consider aggro to be undernourished, and building a mid-range deck is likely a mistake. Let us begin with a discussion of combo, a hallmark of this environment. There are a great many famous combos in evidence here. From those that require just a couple of cards, such as Tinker and Kikijiki, to those that are slightly more involved, such as some versions of Reanimator and Mindslaver shenanigans, 
The headline combo, though, is Storm. I do not personally like supporting Storm and Cube, although I do enjoy playing the deck. It is a parasitic archetype, which is to say that most of its cards work only with each other and are of little use to other decks. If two drafters compete for the archetype, both are likely to end up with losing piles, and given the narrow utility of the Storm cards, it is hard for drafters to jump ship once they commit to the plan. Even a very good Storm deck has a high fail rate, and Storm decks effectively want to play non-interactive games of Solitaire, and slow Solitaire at that, which may not be fun for everyone at the table. Archetype parasitism is a less acute illness when only a few cards are devoted to supporting a combo. For instance, the desire to support Kiki Twin results in the inclusion of Pestermide and Deceiver Exarch, which are parasitic as they have no reason to exist save for the combo. Other combo pieces, such as Restoration Angel and Zealous Conscripts, can be useful elsewhere as well. Storm, though, occupies a substantial swath of cube real estate. By my count, there are 26 cards in the cube, whose only purpose is to enable Storm. I leave aside, of course, cards that are good everywhere, such as Moxon. That is 4.8% of the cube, a large number to devote to one unreliable deck. You might well object that there are cards that only Mono Red Aggro, for instance, wants. A generous analysis of red 1 and 2 CMC creatures finds 11 creatures for red deck wins. Almost all of the red creatures that cost 3 or more have application elsewhere. The deck wants burn spells as well, but these will be desirable in other decks. I would suggest that the total space devoted to exactly mono red aggro is 13 cards, or 2.4% of the cube. Or to take another combo deck, I also count 13 cards that are useful only to Reanimator. I leave aside finishers that may elsewise be cheated into play. While Reanimator can certainly fail, it has some features to recommend it. It has a higher win percentage than Storm. Unlike Storm, it can effectively kill on turn 1. And the Reanimator deck does not have to be quite as all-in on its signature strategy as Storm does. I hope you can see that the various combos that reach across colors are supported at an extremely high rate in this cube. Let us briefly consider each color in isolation now, with an eye toward analyzing how well other theaters or strategies are supported. Rather surprisingly, aggressive white decks simply do not exist in this format. There are only five 1CMC creatures, of which one is Mother of Runes, who is fine in aggro, but who is equally fine almost everywhere. I worry though that running four aggressive one-drops in white alongside anthems could trick drafters into believing that White Weenie is supported, particularly given that in other iterations of this cube, White Weenie was a winning strategy. As we will see, the cube supports aggro only in red, and lack of pressure from aggro gives slower, dirtlier strategies much more breathing room, despite the fact that certain decks' nut draws can win on turn one. White does not have a clear identity here. Of course, it is received wisdom that white is the weakest color in cube, and arguably in magic, but I believe that the problem is worsened here. White has some hate bears, but it lacks disruptive elements such as New Thalia and Imposing Sovereign. The lack of white weenie may be the implicit justification for the absence of white disruption. White does not go particularly deep into sweepers. The color boasts a startling number of 5 CMC creatures. I like the density of planeswalkers in evidence here but I am confused by the anthems, given that white aggro does not exist. In sum, I would suggest that white has been built with fair, mid-range strategies in mind, which is not a route to success in this cube. I would hope to play white only as a splash, unless I picked up one of the handful of broken white cards, such as Balance. Jaybro and I conducted a poll on Twitter that asked which color, after blue, you all consider to be the most powerful in this environment. The strong opinion was, anything but white. I turn the mic over to Jaybro now for his picks of the best and worst of white. Now we're going to go over some of the highlights and some of the lowlights from this cube. So let's start with white. The white highlight of this cube, in my opinion, is Moat. There are very few cards in white that can completely flip the script like it. There's nothing around that can shut down the clowns like a Moat. And remember, you can't spell asymmetrical without symmetrical. In other words, something that looks like it has an equal effect for both players rarely actually does. And in Moat's case, there are plenty of ways to get around it, including cute little tricks like 4 mana Elspeth to jump your duders, uh, getting your Baneslayer Bizzle Bedizzles on, other paths to victory such as ultimating Planeswalkers while shutting down creatures completely. The list goes on. Again, Moat gets three bang bang bangs on the chicken wang scale. Now for low lights in white, 
let's cut to the chase. Brightling, one of my least favorite cards in a cube like this. For the mana requirements of one white white in a vintage cube, you gotta give me something special, a lot more special than this. Give me some Flicker Wisp, give me something dope. But this card ain't it. Despite its modality, the mana specific abilities combined with its extremely low power make this the yucky ducky of white. It represents some of the very worst white has to offer in my opinion. Maybe it's an appropriate sideboard slot against certain mono and archetypes, but even then, I really don't like this card and I am very unhappy with its inclusion in the cube. I can't wait for the iterations forthcoming where they finally take it out. Again, Brightling, that's the yucky ducky. Moving on to blue, a first observation is that its creature complement does not support aggressive tempo-based strategies. I have few quibbles with blue's creatures. Given that reanimator is a strategy that is promoted in this cube, I would expect to find more discard outlets in blue, which means that the bottleneck for graveyard strategies is often access to components that put payoffs into the yard. Storm eats into blue space, unsurprisingly. On the whole, I like blue fine. No one will be shocked to learn that blue is the best color, but it is also probably the best designed color in this cube. No secret that blue is the most powerful color in this cube. So we have to dig a little deeper and shoot the angles for what we want to highlight. And for our highlight of this cube in blue, I want to talk about Baral the Buckbuck. Now again, blue's already the best color. It gives so much card advantage. Card advantage in a powerful cube scales up really well. But the one thing it lacks is acceleration. So a card like Baral comes up to you and it's like, hey, you like Impulse, right? Pretty good card. Well, how about this? I'll give you a Baral and I'll toss in an Impulse for half price. Pretty good deal, huh? Okay, Mana Leak you say, deal. And I'll throw in a loot just because I like it. That combined with a three toughness, able to block things like Goblin Guide, etc., makes Baral the Buck Buck the blue highlight of this video. As far as lowlights for this video, we're gonna have to go with Perturpeter and its cousin Delver of Secrets. Now, in its day, Delver dominated, but in a limited format, there's not the support for an extremely aggressive blue spell stack, and it's just really underwhelming. Perturpeter is a little better, because of Mars at least, but blue one mana, one one flyer that eventually might sometime ba 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 ba, not what we want to be doing, not at all. Remember, if you're operating on that axis in a cube like this, you are probably playing too fair, and it's gonna come back and bite you where you don't want to be bitten. So get your Perturpeter and get your Delver of Smelver out of this deck now. Notably, Black Aggro is not supported, and I appreciate that the cube does not pretend otherwise, as the solitary one-drop creature is a discard outlet. Disruptive two-drop creatures such as Mesmeric Fiend are good, but the aggressive creatures such as Glint Sleeve Siphoner seem misplaced without aggro. The three drops are almost all bad, and there are too many six drops. This is emblematic of the many slow options that Black boasts in the realms of tutoring, card draw, and sweepers. There are, however, a great many reanimation spells. Anyone who watches my stream regularly knows exactly what Black's highlight is going to be for this cube. I'll give you a second to think about it. Yep, you got it, Gonti. It could be anything. First off, has a dope ETB trigger. When it enters the battlefield, you get to get information from your opponent's deck, and you get to cast a spell from their deck. All this with a three booty and death touch. And remember, ETB triggers mean you can keep doing it. In one of my cubes, I've been able to deck people with Gonti multiple times. Yes, it's happened twice. So that's another strength to it. You can also deck your opponent. It is possibly not only the most fun card ever made, but it should not be slept on. Its power level is pretty high, and it gets my highlight in black for the cube. Now, black's low light. We're going to have to go with Argyle's Blood, Bizzle, Bad Dizzle, something, something dark. Now, the too long didn't read is this is too expensive for what it's supposed to do. For four mana, two of it being color specific, before you can even draw your first card and you have to lose two life to boot, it's mm, not exactly what we want to be doing in a cube like this. 
there can be applications to the sideboard against slower grindy matchups where you don't really care about your life total but overall this card should not be in the cube as we have seen, red is the one place where the cube tries to support aggro. It can nevertheless be challenging for drafters to put the deck together. The cube has six aggressive red one drops among its 540 cards. In my unpowered vintage cube, I have 10 among 450. I do not suggest that my number is correct, but the point is that the moto cube certainly has not drawn as deep from the aggro well as it might have. Goblin welder is a fun combo enabler, but I am suspicious that it is too cute in this environment. Red Duretti, a backup welder that costs 4 mana, is almost certainly too slow. A final observation is that by my count, Red has 7 storm cards, which is about 10% of the color's real estate. It actually brings two cards I want to highlight in a cube like this. First is Light Up the Stage. One red mana, draw two cards is bonkers, and you will meet the requirement. This is such a wonderfully crafted card and so interesting, I just had to throw it in, and I love it. Secondly, I want to highlight Fiery Confluence. The versatility of this card is dope, and every step of the way is fantastic. Need to deal 6 damage to finish off your opponent? We can do that. Want to clear all those annoying little 3 toughness critters out the way? We can do that. Want to smash a couple artifacts and bank all of your opponent's Bitter Bizzle tokens? Yep, we got you homie. And on and on and on. Fiery Confluence is the cat's pajamas, and this card should not be slept on. The versatility and power level of it makes it mwah, magnifique. Finally, the low light of red is Sweltering Suns. It's useful on first glance, but when you dig a little beyond the surface, it has just a little too much requirements for what you want it to do. Cycling for 3 mana is one more mana than you want to be paying at most, and especially so in a cube like this. And the one red red cost is a little too much color specifics for what it's doing for a cube like this. So it looks good on first glance, but dig a little bit below the surface and you'll realize why it gets the low light for this cube. Creature based ramp is well supported in green. All of the elves are present, as are most of the two mana creatures. Notice that land enchantments are not present at all, nor are any of the two mana ramp sorceries. The absence of such card makes green ramp less reliable than it might otherwise be. Green does have plenty of cheaty effects, such as Raphalos and Gaia's Cradle for big mana, plus usual suspects such as Natural Order and Oath of Druids. I appreciate the density of Planeswalkers here, which are the mid-range threats that green should be running, in preference to Oracle of Moldaya, Master of the Wild Hunt, Acidic Slime, and so on. For green, it was an easy choice. The highlight I want to talk about is Ramanamadamdam. Between fetches, strip mines, mox diamond, looting effects, etc., this card gets bang 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 on the chicken wang scale. That's right, three out of three bangs on the chicken wang scale. It's also got the three booty, which is relevant, and has two power, which can challenge plane walkers from time to time, can make it harder for red or white decks to want to attack into you, etc. This card does a lot when you put it to the test. Now, the low card is one I feel kind of bad about trash talking for green, but we're gonna have to go there. Vivian, quote unquote champion of the wilds? Meh. Look, it's too weak on its loyalty. Its plus is too weak. Its minus is too weak. And its static is really not that great. If, for example, we had a card that was three mana and had a seven loyalty, or if it dug five cards deep, or if there was something better than some counterintuitive static ability, we could talk. And mostly, three mana planeswalkers are the yum yums. But this, this Vivian, this Vivian is tripping. I do not have a great deal to say about the gold section. I have quibbles with individual cards, but I understand that these are often here because they are iconic, they are perceived to be powerful, or they are staples at kitchen tables around the world. We should expect multicolor cards to be a little higher on the power scale because of the additional mana requirements that we're forced to spend on them. But my oh my, do we have a masterpiece for the multicolor highlight? That's right, Duretti Spaghetti, the one black red masterpiece. Magnifique. What can be said about this card? It is definitely purse pickable. It is never despicable. 
It offers so much and asks so little. First off, has a high loyalty. Second off, the modality is just wonderful in a cube like this, making not only things that can block and protect it, but things with one power, definitely relevant. Being able to come down and blow up a big bad body like a Grizzle Bedizzle or something else right away if you have like a Mox or something to sacrifice to it. And having a powerful, potentially powerful ultimate makes people have to deal with it. This card is fantastic. It has so much modality, raw power, and incremental advantage built in, and all for the low, low cost of free mana. Mwah! I love me some Doretti Spaghetti, and I hope you will too. Draft it, enjoy it, you're welcome. As far as the multicolored low light, we're gonna have to go with something kinda boring. Ancient Grudge. It is too narrow and not powerful enough for being three mana and two color specific, even if that cost is on layaway. And also, green and red already have dope effects like this that are attached to creatures, like Mangle Badangle or Manic Vandal or something else. So this card's kind of just meh. I think it should be out of the cube and replaced with something a little more fun, like Savage Born Hydra, for example. Or there's plenty of other dope cards in the rule, but I don't like Ancient Grudge and I hope it gets taken out. The most surprising aspect of the colorless section is that it boasts 12. 12 spells that cost 6 or more mana. In fact, all but two of these cost seven or more. For comparison, in my smaller cube, I run six colorless spells that cost six and up. The lessons are that Wizards wants you to be cheating things into play, and you should not prioritize drafting expensive payoffs, as they should be available throughout the draft. A cheaty artifact deck is a viable strategy, underpinned by a great number of mana rocks. All of the swords of X and Y are here, save for the newest ones from Modern Horizons. These are iconic cards and people love them, but people also tend to put these in decks where they do not belong. Stax appears to be supported, but it is not supported well, and even if it were, it is extremely doubtful that it is viable at this power level. As far as our colorless cards go, let me start by saying Lightning Greaves has been and continues to be one of the most underrated cards in the whole cube, which is why it gets my highlight. All of your thready yum-yums running their little hearts out across the battlefield with their dope new Jordans is an awesome sight to be seen. It also gives you reach when your opponent's at a low life, having your top deck Baneslayer Bizzle Bedizzle with haste that can't be targeted. Oh, what a time. And it can gain you life sometimes, meaning your opponents don't want to be attacking you because they can't afford to block, which can offer you more turns to draw more material to kill them. Lightning Greaves, highly underrated, much anticipation, and it goes especially good in white, where you can search it up with certain creatures, or where you can equip it to your Burmas, or to your 3-4 for 4-mana four, four version of Burmas, and all these other yum-yums that attack and do cool stuff. Check out Lightning Greaves, it's awesome, you're welcome. Conversely, the three mana Tangled Angle is one of my least favorites. It's basically considered an auto include, but it gets the low light because I don't think it deserves to be. It can be backbreaking under certain circumstances. Yes, you can juggle it with some cool tricks, but it's so narrow, it's so hit or miss, it's kind of uninteractive, not very really fun, and there's just so many extra clicks and triggers with it. Eh, I think it deserves the colors low light, not my favorite. Plans in this cube, the highlights are any ones that produce extra mana. Yes, even Nick those. So we're talking your Misha's Workshop, your Gaia's Cradle, we're talking about Talarian Academy, Ancient Tube. Remember, in a cube of this power level, mana acceleration is even better. It scales up so well. On top of it all, it's just a blast to play. So have some fun, draft lands that produce extra mana, and start doing your busted stuff just a little bit earlier. In general, with extra text that do extra stuff are basically like free spells. Remember how powerful cards like Soul Ring, Moxes, Dark Ritual, and other mana accelerants are. Think about using it every single turn. I want you to buy it, try it, country steak fry it. Jonathan will now explain to us the deck strategies that are his top performers, and he will go deep on the logic of one particular deck style to show where his priorities lie as he conquers a draft. Usually with a cube like this, I find myself falling into one of the three following archetypes, and I've included cute little animals to make it easier to remember. First, we've got Myrtle the Dirtle Turtle. She is slow and steady with a strong protective shell. And when you get something a little too close, you get a little too comfortable with her, she bites. 
This is a deck that often utilizes stronger, multicolored spells. I'm thinking between three and five colors. Has a lot of man lands in order to generate extra value and probably a fair amount of planeswalkers for that incremental value each turn as well. As well as a suite of removal, both targeted and sweepers, and things to deal with planeswalkers, artifacts, etc. Again, it's probably going to be a little slower. It's a strong protective shell, so maybe some life gains, some walls, etc. But this is a really fun archetype, and you can often go above the power levels of your non-broken opponents, as well as enough meaningful interaction and card advantage to keep up with most of what you're going to be facing in a vintage cube of this nature. Next, we've got Desmond, the Disruptive Duck. Desmond is full of hand disruption, cheap interactive spells, and all that quacking makes it awful hard for a spiky opponent to concentrate on their combo because your Inquisition of Kozleks are ripping apart their hands, your Thought Season are taking out their combo pieces, your Lightning Bolts are binking their important little duders, and your Counter Magic is messing with them. Now Desmond is one that is more focused on denying all the resources for your opponent and then just being the last one at the show with any sort of something or other to show for it. Last but not least, we've got Chelsea, the Charging Cheetah. Chelsea is fast, slick, and low to the ground. Not necessarily as powerful as the other animals in the zoo, but very consistent and often able to catch the other decks off guard. Now this is especially so for decks such as Mono White and Mono Red, where you're going to not always be able to kill turn 2 or turn 3 like some of the other decks, but you should be able to consistently kill turn 4 or 5, and you also don't have to worry about your mana fixing, you don't have to worry about uh, your different pieces coming together at the right time, and the consistency and low to the ground nature of decks like these make them really appealing in a format where people are trying to do all sorts of wild stuff and might sacrifice some of their consistency for a higher ceiling. This video is not necessarily to try to push you towards one strategy or another. To say you should always draft mono green ramp in this particular cube or always mono white or always five color or whatever. First off, the best part about cubing is it allows you to have a powerful strategy, especially in a cube like this, in pretty much whatever way you want to do it. So if you're more of a combo player, you can be a combo player. If you're more a low to the ground aggressive player, you can do that. Whatever your flavor, here you can savor. And to that end, I want to not just push a particular design of drafting like that, but more so let you into the mentality and the tactics and the ideas that come into play when crafting a strategy for drafting this cube. To that end, I would like to let you in on my favorite, funnest, best deck that I like to draft most consistently in a cube like this, and in this cube in particular. That is the No Fear Demir, defined by its cheap interaction, its incredibly powerful spells, and its ability to efficiently utilize mana on a regular basis. So, you have awesome cheap interactions such as Daze, Counterspell, Mana Leak, Go for the Throat, Fatal Push, Duress, Thoughtseize, etc. You also have really cheap, really powerful spells like Bitter Blossom, Search for Ascanta, Snapcaster Mage, Pack Rat, etc. So you can be doing really good broken things for really cheap while messing with your opponent and making sure that they're off their game plan and they're not firing on all cylinders. If they're a combo deck, you disrupt the combo. If they're a creature deck, you've got answers for that. One of the most common and powerful go-to decks, understandably so, in a format like this, is going to be your, what I call, kind of glass cannon decks, or your Jenga Jizzle Bedizzle business. Now, the Jenga decks, or the glass cannon decks, are ones that are very powerful, but easy to disrupt and make fall apart. And it's not all the time that you get to draft a cool combo deck that can do all this awesome stuff or reanimate on turn two. But if you don't get exactly what you need, or if someone has a little bit of disruption, you can tip that Jenga deck right on over. So, being able to control the pace of the game as well as kind of throw some disruption into your opponent's hands are exactly why a Demir deck can flourish in a format like this. 
Remember, they want to kind of goldfish you with those decks, but all you got to do is dink on that glass cannon a little bit and it can shatter right in front of your opponent's face. Playing one's own combo that is faster, more powerful, more resilient, or getting under the combo with a more aggressive deck are also ways to navigate this format. But I think that the funnest way and my kind of favorite go-to in this is a Demir deck. One with counter spells, one with hand disruption, one with creature kill. And remember, there's a couple different types of combos in a cube like this. So you're going to want to have answers to multiple things. Main ones are Storm, Reanimate, and Green. Yes, Green. I basically consider Green a combo cube, but... Again, a glass cannon that's easily disrupted. You just have to bink off some of their early mana dorks before they can natural order you or tooth and nail you or whatever. And with the Storm deck, it can be a little more resilient, but still easy to pick apart. Although you're going to have to sideboard probably a lot of your creature kill out unless you see a Baral or Goblin Pyromancer or something of that nature. Last but not least, Reanimator. Again, hand disruption is key, as well as specific types of removal spells. And once you mess with them a little bit, you're free to do whatever you want. And again, that means you don't necessarily have to have a ton of threat density. You just need to be able to match their intensity. You need to have answers for their questions, pick apart their hand, in a consistent but powerful path to victory in a cube like this. The other thing that's really nice about this deck is that it has really, really good 3-mana Planeswalkers. Specifically, Liliana of the Veil and Ashiok, two of the best. And if you're forcing black and blue early, it's possible you can wield these rather late. Now, I mentioned Ashiok, but I really want to kind of elaborate on that in specific because the Guild of Demir has the most powerful pound for pound cards out of any of the guilds, top to bottom. Baleful Strix, a two mana flying death touching monster, draws a card each time it comes into play. Sign me up. You got Ashiok, we talked about her already, but she can end the game real quick, especially if you've got a lot of interaction and they have to dedicate even more resources trying to get her off the board when you can blow up their creatures that are attacking her, counter their burn spells coming after her. You've also got Thief of Sanity, which left unchecked can completely dominate the game. You all know how much I like Gunt, right? And Hostage Taker, which is amazing in a cube like this. You can take out their threats, you can also protect your own threats and play them again if they have an ETB ability. And you can Stockholm Syndrome your opponent's artifacts and take their moxes right away, which is pretty dope. But last and certainly best, we have the real bang banger. We have the unbelievable 5-5 five, five for 5 that's hard to get rid of. Yeah, you heard it right, the Scarab God. This will take over games on its own. It is one of the best late game finishers and it is at a cheap five mana. Ooh, sign me up. It gets stuff back that can one, trigger their ETB abilities, two, come to play right away as four force, three are black zombies, which are relevant for her ability because each zombie lets you scry and makes them die. Ooh, Scare of God is just so, so, so good, firing on all cylinders. And it's also one of the few threats you're actually going to need in a deck like this. Remember, with a no fear to mirror playstyle, you don't have to pack your deck full of threats and big daddy baddies. You don't have to waste your slots. You only have to have a handful. I would say three, four tops is what you want in a deck like this. And Scarab God or Frost Titan, any of those types of cards will do. Gravy Train, all that stuff is fantastic. But you are going to be drawing more cards than normal, so you can search through it. Again, you don't have to clunkify your deck with all these hard to cast threats. So No Fear Demir is my pick of the funnest, best, most consistent deck I like to play in a draft like this because it has cheap interaction, you get to see what your opponent's doing, you can often see their hand, you get to have really powerful threats at cheap, like Bitter Blossom or Ashiok, and you get awesome multicolored cards like Scarab God, the aforementioned Ashiok, etc. So I hope this has been helpful. 
thank you very much for checking it out. This is my first video. Let me know what you think in the comments. And huge thank you to Cultic Cube for bringing us together, making it happen. Appreciate you. Appreciate you for checking us out. This is Team Jaybro. I'm out. I appreciate Jaybro's insights into how he processes cubes and reliably wins drafts. Check out his Twitch stream, which is always a great time. Check out my Patreon as well, and wander around the channel for more cube theory and practice, such as my argument for dispensing with planeswalker caps. Let's keep hanging out and chatting cube.